about one hour. Okay. And uh, so, so one hour for five papers, we will have about nine to 10 paper, not nine to 10 minutes for uh, um, showing the presentations um, that we'll show uh, shortly. And then uh, two or three minutes per paper for question and answer. Uh, while seeing the presentations or um, during the question and answer, if you have any questions for the presenter uh, or the authors, uh, please feel free to write them on the chat and I will read them aloud to everybody uh, for the presenters to, um, um, to respond. Uh, okay, um, without any further delay, so let's, you know, um, end quickly um, this part and let's move to the more interesting uh, things, the papers. I will start sharing my screens and we will see the presentation. So every presentation, as we mentioned, nine to 10 minutes, followed by two to three minutes question and answers. So uh, the first presentation or the first paper um, will, will, will be was, uh, was titled APAC an accurate and adaptive prefetch framework with concurrent memory access analysis. It will be presented by Chao Yang Lu, uh, who is a PhD candidate at Illinois Institute of Technology. We will start um, the presentation um, right now. Good morning, everyone. I am Xiao Yang. I will present APAC, an accurate and adaptive profile framework with concurrent memory access analysis. This is the work I did with my advisor, Professor Ru Jia Wang and Professor Xian He San at Illinois Tech. The unbalanced development speed of the processor technology and the memory technology has caused the memory access speed to lag behind the processor's computation speed. We call this kind of problem the memory wall problem. In order to solve memory wall problem, improving the data locality and the data concurrency are the two basic approaches. The overall performance of a memory system is a combined effort of memory hierarchy and the concurrency. In order to evaluate the performance of the modern memory systems, pure means is proposed to consider the concurrent memory accesses. A pure means is a means containing at least one cycle which does not have any key activity, which severely hurt performance. The data perfection has been proved to be effective in reducing the CPU store cycles. How aggressive a data perfection should be is a problem often discussed because or aggressive perfection may lead to useless bandwidth consumption and catch pollution. In addition, various workloads may have different behaviors. Even for a gaming workload, it may have different access, memory access patterns in different phases and show different sensitivity to perfect aggressiveness. To address these issues, an adaptive perfection framework is needed. The traditional perfectors are designed around a fundamental trade-off between two important metrics, uh, perfect accuracy and perfect coverage. Perfect accuracy reflects the percentage of useful perfectors out of all perfectors, and perfect coverage is a fraction of total misses that can be effectively reduced by perfection. Without considering the concurrent memory accesses, an effective perfecter usually means to cover as many potential misses as possible. However, the perfect coverage may provide inaccurate measurements for a perfecter when we consider the concurrent data accesses. In the case one with perfection, access E is saved by perfect and now becomes E prime in figure 1b. Although access C and D are still misses with full miss cycles, these cycles are no longer the pure miss cycles because they overlap with the kit cycles of access B and access E prime. In this example, the perfection only reduces one miss. So the 
perfect coverage is just one third. However, all the concurrent pure misses now have the hit miss overlap. Even though the perfect coverage is relatively low, uh, the performance gain from perfection is huge. In the case two, after perfection, as shown in figure 2b, access A and C are saved by perfection, and they became the perfect gate A prime and C prime. In this example, two misses are reduced. We calculate the perfect coverage as two thirds, which means that we saved the majority of miss. However, the total cycle span on memory accesses are not saved. Access F is still a pure miss with three pure miss cycles, even though the perfect coverage is high. The professor may not able to improve performance if the pure miss reduction is low. Therefore, a novel perfection metric that can identify an accurate perfection coverage under the concurrent memory access model is needed. We proposed pure perfect coverage. Different from the definition of the perfect coverage, the pure perfect coverage is defined as the fraction of the number of uh, pure misses reduced due to perfection over the overall number of the pure misses that will occur without perfection. Then we propose an adaptive perfection framework APAC that takes into account data access concurrency and adjusts the aggressiveness of perfection at runtime. In APAC, we use pure perfect coverage, perfect accuracy, and pure miss rate without perfection as the feedback matrix for adjusting the aggressiveness of perfection. If the value of the pure miss rate without perfection is smaller than the related threshold except for the case two, the APAC tends to degrade the aggressiveness of the perfection since we do now need to reduce the pure misses at the cost of accuracy. In case two, when the perfect accuracy is high and the pure perfect coverage is smaller than the threshold, the APAC suggests increasing the aggressiveness for higher gain from the accurate prediction. If the pure miss rate without the perfection is larger than the threshold, the perfection tends to increase aggressiveness for higher the pure profile coverage, which degrades the pure misses and improve the performance. The case eight is an exception. In this case, APAC decreases the aggressiveness of perfecture to reduce the cache pollution and save the memory bandwidth because the current phase shows that the perfecture cannot perfect accurately. We implement our framework APAC with both a single core system and a full core system. The Chemisync simulator is used in this study, and the detail of the parameters of our simulation are described in this table. We collect the traces from spec CPU 2006 and spec CPU 2017. We selected uh, the performance result of perfecture at the baseline for the performance comparison. We compare APAC against two state-of-the-art adaptive perfection framework, FDP and NST. We also implement a naive adaptive uh, framework called NAP with a small similar workload as APAC. Uh, however, the NAP makes all decisions without considering uh, concurrency. This figure shows that the single core speed up achieved by uh, NAP, FDP, NST, and APAC. All results are normalized to the baseline of no perfection. The APAC provides a 17% higher GOME I. PC over the baseline. 
for the full core mixed uh, workload, the figure show that the APAC achieves an improvement of around 62% on average, which is higher than the NAP, FTP, and NST. It is worth noting that our framework can be easily integrated with more complex um, perfetching algorithms and extend through the multiple memory hierarchies. We apply IPAC to the open source IPCP. Comparing to utilize IPCP alone, applying IPAC to the IPCP provides the additional performance improvement of 3.2% and 3.4% in the single core and four core configuration. In this paper, we identify the concurrency of memory exercises is an important factor when evaluating the uh, perfect accuracy. We propose a pure perfect coverage. Furthermore, we design an adaptive perfect framework APAC based on the concurrent aware metrics. The APAC outperforms state of art frameworks and it can be easily integrated with other advanced perfectors. Thank you. All right, thank you so much uh, for the interesting presentation. I ask um, the authors and the presenter to unmute themselves and the audience, if you have uh, questions regarding the paper, please write it in the chat. Um, and until there are any questions on the chat, I would like to thank the author. And I have actually a couple of questions from for Jiao Yang Lu. Um, you are, yeah, hello. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, can you actually, as, uh, thank you for the presentation, and can you actually give us um, a quick, um, more precise definition to the, the, the expression pure miss? Yes, so we know the memory concurrency reduces uh, the memory slow time by uh, overlapping the multiple uh, outstanding memory accesses. So some means, uh, occur concurrently with other keys. So that is kind of uh, hit miss overlapping and some miss uh, do not. So so a single miss, a single cache miss latency is no longer uh, a important factor to the overall memory uh, system performance. So so the, the performance loss reducing from a, a cache miss that can be uh, reduced when there is a hit miss uh, overlapping. So when a miss has no such uh, hit overlapping, so it becomes the important factor that could hurt the um, performance. So we call that this kind of uh, miss is pure miss, so yeah. Okay, great, thank you so much. And mm -hmm. one more question. Um, you showed here results for uh, the single threaded application since you use the, the, the spec. 2006 and 17, and then mm -hmm. you show the multi-programming uh, environment with the mix. Um, do you think there may there will be any changes in 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 the results if you use multi-threaded applications, something like you know uh, Parsec, for example, or something like this? So so uh, we now use that kind of uh, multi-thread application in this uh, paper, but. Uh, we we think if we use the multi-thread uh, application, if the, it's, this kind of application has, uh, it's memory intensive and it has enough uh, concurrency, so that's the performance will be better. So we think our model is focused on the memory intensive benchmarks and focus on uh, the concurrency, yeah. I see, great, thank you so much. Um, you. Any, any questions from, from the audience? All right, thanks a lot. In the usual case, we would have given you an upload, but assume that we have a virtual upload for you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. And we will uh, move to the next paper. Um, the next paper um, was the title, Reducing Off-Chip Miss Penalty 
by exploiting under hello everyone i am abhijit uh, das from indian sorry sorry um let me finish the title sorry for that reducing off chip miss penalty by exploiting underutilized on chip uh, router buffers and it will be presented by abhijit das who is a phd scholar in the department of computer science and engineering at the indian institute of technology Hello everyone, I am Abhijit Das from Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati, India, and I welcome you all to the presentation of our paper titled Reducing Off-Chip Miss Penalty by Exploiting Underutilized On-Chip Router Buffers. This is the outline of my presentation, so let's get started. The era of data-driven applications demand for quickest processing of information and hence all the processing devices in and around us are realized by some form of a multi-core processor. To understand with an example, even the simplest of handheld devices like our mobile phones are powered with at least a quad-core or even an octa-core processor. These multi-core processors conceptually look like this, where they are arranged in a regular tiled fashion and hence they are popularly known as tile chip multiprocessors or TCMPs. The TCMPs have processing elements or PEs which have a processor along with the on-chip caches. In most of the modern TCMPs, L2 cache serves as the last level cache or LLC. Processing elements communicate with one another through an underlying communication framework called Network on Chip or NOC. Everything travels as packets and NOC has routers that facilitate the travel of packets from source to their destination. Let us try to understand the communication flow in a TCMP. For all, the data and coherence related message exchange an L1 cache controller communicates with the corresponding LLC or directory controller, which in turn communicates with the corresponding memory controller. Both of these communication are done through the underlying NOC. Our work is focused on the communication between an LLC directory controller and memory controller, and hence our discussion is limited to that. During a block replacement in LLC, evicted clean blocks are discarded, whereas dirty blocks are sent for write back. We know that message in TCMPs travel as packets and packets are further divided into flits. A request packet consists of a head flit whereas a reply packet consists of a head flit followed by multiple body flits and ended by a tail flit. For example, a dirty block evicted from the LLC enter the local router and gets stored in one of the input buffers or VCs. It takes part in routing and arbitration decisions before going out of the router towards its destination. As shown in the figure, dirty block A evicted from the LLC is sent towards the memory controller for write back. However, due to temporal locality of reference, recently evicted LLC blocks are re-referenced within a small time interval. For example, the recently evicted block A is re-referenced and requested from the memory controller again. For standard multiprocessor applications, the average re-reference time is very less. However, the re-referenced block needs to be brought back from the off-chip memory, which is very expensive. It has also been observed that the LLC miss penalty is almost similar for all the applications. In another interesting observations, we found that router buffers are underutilized and at least one VC is always free except during peak network congestion. Now we have three observations and if we carefully merge them, we can propose a solution to store evicted LLC blocks in underutilized VCs and upon re-reference, we generate local replies from the routers to avoid off-chip miss penalty. In the proposed architecture, we have added an SRFD unit in NOC routers to facilitate our optimizations. We have modified packet header to include four additional flags and we have also made minimal modification to the LLC directory controller and memory controller to maintain cache coherence with our optimizations. For local store, when an evicted LLC block reaches the local router, SRFD unit checks the store flag. If the store flag is found set, SRFD unit disables VC and switch arbitration to facilitate local store. It is as if we have logically cut the output path of a VC where the evicted block is stored. 
This way, we can keep the evicted block stored in the local router for as long as it is not interrupted. Some of the evicted clean LLC blocks are also sent to the routers for local store to improve our chances of local reply. To generate a local reply when a new LLC block request reaches the local router, SRFD unit checks the S flag to identify if it is a read request. If the flag is found set, SRFD compares the address of the requested block with all the stored LLC blocks and if the address matches, appropriate steps are taken to send a local reply. The stored block is sent back to the same LLC block as a local reply and the request is dropped as it need not travel any further. If the X flag is not set, meaning it is not a read request, then we check if it is a write request with the help of the X flag. If the X flag is set and the requested address has matched with a stored block, we perform similar steps for local reply but with an additional check of the dirty flag. If and only if the dirty flag is set for the matched stored block, we know that the block is exclusive and hence we can generate a local reply. However, if the matched block is not dirty, it is simply dropped as it need not be forwarded for write back. In this case, a local reply is not possible and hence the request is forwarded towards the memory controller. We cannot keep the evicted LLC blocks stored in the local router forever as it might create injection suppression during peak network congestion. So when VCs are full, a locally stored dirty block is enabled for VC and switch arbitration to reach its destination for write back. Whereas for locally stored clean block, it is simply dropped as a write back is not necessary. We employed two approaches for forwarding and dropping locally stored LLC blocks called defensive and aggressive. When VCs are full, defensive approach dictates that if any one of the VCs have a stored block, it needs to be vacated. Whereas aggressive approach dictates that only when all the VCs have stored blocks, one of them is vacated. We have used an 8 cross 8 NOC based TCMP and this is our system configuration. We have used GEM5 and Descent simulators for performance and overhead analysis. We have considered four different architectures for evaluation where the baseline architecture is without any optimization and the other three architectures have different optimizations that we have proposed. All our results are normalized with respect to the baseline architecture. We have created diverse workload mixes and considered LLC miss penalty, network stall time and system speed up for performance evaluation. As we can see, for all the workload mixes, our proposed architectures achieve significant performance gain. We also conducted a sensitivity analysis to understand the impact of design parameters and these are the results. Additional SRFD unit works in parallel with the RC unit, hence it is not in the critical path of execution. Four additional flags included in the packet header does not have any storage overhead but the modified routers have a negligible area and leakage power overhead. However, improved performance reduces dynamic power consumption. To conclude, we learned that evicted LLC blocks are re-referenced within a small time interval and on-chip router buffers are underutilized. Hence, we proposed a set of NOC-based TCMP architectures to keep evicted LLC blocks stored in local router buffers and facilitate direct reply upon re-reference. Our future work includes looking for additional storage in and around NOC routers. That's all from my presentation. Due to the time constraint, I could not explain everything with sufficient details. However, if you are interested, you may read our paper and reach out to us for any discussion or clarification. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for the interesting work. Um, I ask the presenter and any of the authors of the paper uh, present to please unmute your mic. And I ask the audience if if you have any questions, please write it in the chat. And uh, meanwhile, um, I have a few questions um, for you. 
uh, Abhijit. Yes, sir. Um, okay, so you guys are storing uh, the evicted blocks in, in the buffers. So don't you think it would be then cheaper uh, if we design the routers of the NOC with fewer buffers? So in that case, since anyway, you, you found that the buffers are not really fully utilized. So why actually we have this kind of big buffers in the first place? Uh, thank you for the question, sir. Uh, yes, uh, what we have seen in modern uh, TCMPs uh, or multiprocessors is that uh, two uh, for, for the worst case performance bandwidth, they are equipped with buffer because there are all there there has been alternative uh, alternative designs with bufferless routers as well as minimally buffered routers. However, uh, what happens is that uh, during a peak network congestion, even though the cases are few, but during peak network congestion, uh, there, there there has been performance degradation because of the uh, lack of buffers. So. Uh, it 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 is a kind of an uh, kind kind of an established fact in the literature that uh, irrespective of the uh, advantages with uh, minimally buffered and route, uh, bufferless routers uh, the modern tcmps are equipped with buffers however we have also done a sensitivity analysis to see if we uh, uh, reduce the number of buffers then how the performance will be impacted so of course, as we reduce the number of buffers, automate. I mean, uh, the performance accordingly degrades. I see. Okay, thank you so much. Um, one last question. Um, of course, when there is a peak and we see congestion, you will not have space in the buffers uh, for storage. Uh, from your experiments, um, can you comment on how often does this scenario happen? Uh, that uh, the, uh, from our experiment, we have found out that uh, that kind of a peak network in, uh, congestion scenario where none of the buffers were available because for our experiments, we have used four buffers in a router. So with our experiment, uh, uh, experiments, we have found that uh, close to uh, five to 6% of the time, there were no buffers available. I see, okay, great. And Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thanks a lot and a virtual applause. <laughs> thanks a Thank lot. Thank you, sir. Um, all right, so uh, we will be moving to the next uh, paper. Uh, just a second, please. Um, okay, uh, the third uh, paper will be um, titled uh, Router Buffer Caching for Managing Shared Cache Blocks in Tiled Multi-Core Processors. And it will be presented by Joe Augustine, um, who is currently working as a silicon design engineer at AMD India. Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Augustine from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, India. Our work is titled Router buffer caching for managing shared cache blocks in tiled multi core processors. Introduction This figure shows the picture of a four core processor. Each core is connected to an L1 cache, and the last layer cache is connected to all the cores using a bus interface. Here, the LLC is shared by all the cores. In this design, if the number of cores increases, the bus interface and the shared monolithic LLC will become a bottleneck. To solve the scaling issue, tile chip multi-core processor was introduced. In this design, each tile has a compute pipeline, L1 I cache, L1 D cache, a portion of shared L2 cache with directory to store and share information, and a router. All these tiles are connected using a network called network on chip. This is the structure of an NOC. Processing elements are connected using routers, and each router are interconnected using links. Routers have input ports with buffers. We consider a two-stage pipeline router with routing unit, VC allocator, and switch allocator. In tile chip multi-core processor, when a core wants some data, it sends the request to the L1 controller. It checks the L1 cache for the requested block. If it is a mess, 
The L1 controller sets the L2 bank address that has the block and forwards the request to the router. The router then forwards this packet to the destination L2 bank. The network on chip uses XY routing. So the packet moves in the X axis direction first and then in the Y direction. Once the request reaches the L2 controller, it checks the tags and find it is a hit. The L2 controller replace the requested block back to the requesting core. The figure shows a 64 core system. Let's say core 55, 56 and 7 request for the address X and core 16 request for address Y. Both the requests are mapped in L2 slice 55 and all the requests for address X reached 55 first. The request for Y reached last. Here, the request for Y has to wait till all the requests to X gets completed. When this occurs often, that L2 bank becomes a hotspot. And the L2 access time increases for that LLC bank. If we can store highly shared blocks like the block which contains address X in the previous slide, in a faster memory, we can save precious LLC access time. To see how much sharing happens in a multi-threaded application, we show the sharer length in, the, in this picture. We define sharer length as the number of cores accessing a cache line at the LLC before a write access by any core or before the cache line is evicted from the LLC. From graphs, it is evident that there are many workloads like CF, CG, etc which has blocks with high share length all these applications suffer from high llc access time due to shared blocks this figure shows the heat map of read accesses by cores to llc banks in the application k core for k core there are three sli llc slices which are shown in red which receive significantly more read shared re requests than other tiles so Highly shared blocks also creates hotspots in the in the system. To reduce access time of shared blocks, we propose a small cache inside the router called router buffer cache or RBC to store blocks with high share length. When there is a read request from a core and the request reaches the L2 controller, based on our prediction, the L2 controller creates a copy of that block in the router as fleets. When there is a second request to the same block and it reaches the destination router, the router checks the RBC for a tag match. Since we already made a copy in the RBC, the request gets a hit and RBC replies with the requested block. The requested block reaches the requester. In case of a write request, when the request reaches the home node, the router's copy of the block is invalidated first to maintain coherency. Then the request is forwarded to the L2 controller, which will invalidate all the sharers. In case the L2 evicts a shared block, the L2 controller invalidates all the shares, including the network cache copy. We observe that blocks belonging to the same page have a similar sharing pattern. Figure classifies the sharing pattern of shared blocks belonging to the same page with at least one block having sharers greater than a sharer threshold. Red shows fraction of such blocks that have sharers greater than the sharer threshold. To summarize, if there exists at least one high share block in a page, on an average, 90% of the cache blocks in the same page are also high share blocks. To save this page information, we added a small table called the history table. When a block X has sharers greater than the sharer threshold, the L2 controller stores the page number of that block in the history table.
When a request comes to the L2 controller, it checks if the block is going from exclusive to shared state. If yes, the controller searches the page number in the history table. When it is a hit, the controller makes a copy of the block in the RBC. We use Sniper Simulator to simulate the following architecture with 64 cores. Each core has L1 I cache, D cache, uh, and a portion of the LLC. We use invalidation based MESA protocol for maintaining coherency. We use A8 mesh, which uses XY routing to route packets from source to destination. These are the LLC access time. An RBC with just eight entries reduces the overall LLC access latency by 16% when compared to a system without RBC. Detailed analysis is given in our paper. In the KCore application, we had observed that there are three LLC slices which receive significantly high number of shared read requests when compared to other LLC slices. With our technique, there is around 60% reduction in the number of LLC accesses. Overall, there is an 80% reduction in LLC access time. To conclude, we propose an intelligent congestion management scheme for shared blocks using network caching. We proposed a classifier which profiles sharing of blocks at runtime. We reduced the overall LLC access time by 16%. We also show that our technique reduces hotspots at the LLC slices. We conclude that our technique is instrumental in dealing with shared cache blocks in tiled multi-core processors. That's all for my presentation. Due to time constraint, I couldn't explain everything with sufficient details. However, if you are interested, you may read our paper and reach out for any discussions or clarification. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And um, I ask the presenter and the rest of the authors to unmute themselves. And I ask the audience if they have any question to write it on the chat. Um, and meanwhile, um, I have a quick question for Joe. Um, yep. is, is there any specific reasons in your experiments um, you are using L2 as the LLC? Uh, I mean, not L3, for example, with having L2 as a private per core or something like this, which is usually is a more, more widely used configuration. Uh, hi, Sahran. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so we uh, actually wanted to expose the, uh, the shared blocks which are stored in the like, last level cache that is, uh, which is a shared distributed uh, LLC. So like uh, even if it's a two level or three level uh, cache, we uh, we'll get the same uh, I mean, similar. We can see the similar patterns in the last level cache. So if you have multiple layers of caches, the simulation speed also get drastically affected by that. So that's the main reason why we selected two two levels as the uh, cache hierarchy levels. Oh, okay, uh, great. And uh, I know the RBC is small in size based on the configurations that you showed, but did it add any? Um, you know, delay to the router by any chance? Uh, so, uh, the, yeah, uh, so the RBC uh, lookup time is uh, perfectly fits with, so the router has multiple uh, pipeline stages, right? So the RBC lookup time uh, is not adding to that pipeline stages. So it sit, sits within uh, one of these stages so that the access time is masked by the pipeline stage. So yeah, it doesn't add, add any, any uh, any, any delay to the system. Okay, great, thank you. And there is one question from the audience about the delay and area overhead with the RBC uh, in the proposed scheme. Um, do you have something to tell us about the delay and area overhead? Yeah, so uh, there is no delay uh, uh, by, by adding uh, an RBC. Uh, the area overhead is under 0.5%. Uh, it's specifically specified in our paper. Um, so when compared to the L1, I mean, L2 size, so yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And a virtual upload um, to you guys. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, so we are moving to uh, the next paper uh, with the title, 
a study of runtime adaptive prefetching for STTRAM L1 caches. Um, and the author uh, is, uh, um, or the presenter will be Kyle Kwan, uh, who is a PhD candidate in the electrical and computer engineering with University of Arizona. Hi, I'll be presenting our work for ICCD 2020. Our paper title is A Study of Runtime Adaptive Prefetching for SCD RAM L1 Caches. My name is Kyle Kwan, and my advisor is Tosseron Adikbija. We're with Electrical and Computer Engineering, University of Arizona. For brevity, we only want to point out partial backgrounds of SCD RAM for what our works aim to optimize. For additional SDRAM details, please refer to our paper. SDRAM have several advantages, including higher density than SRAM, low leakage power because of its non volatility and so on. Uh, one apparent drawback here is that it has relatively long write latency and high write energy compared to the SRAM. This could be prohibitive in resource constrained computer system. And one common approach to mitigate these drawbacks is to trade the non-volatility or the retention time for less write latency and write energy. So as, you, as we can see uh, from the shown cache parameters, as the retention time is reduced from one millisecond to 25 microsecond, SDTRAM write cycles reduce by half and the write energy also reduced by half. So next, we'll look at some prior works and how they implement this trade-off. The first is multi-retention level cache, which uses different retention time in different cache level. For example, if data is rapidly swapped in L1, we may not need zone retention time in L1. And on the other hand, we may need as long as uh, three seconds in, in L2 or less level cache. And one downside of this is it requires costly refresh buffer to avoid excessive misses resulting from short retention time or what we call the expiration misses. When a block remains in the cache beyond the retention time, the data becomes stale and it needs to be refreshed or uh, evicted to lower level cache. The second approach is adaptive retention cache. This approach predicts the ideal retention time during the sampling phase in order to satisfy the application's requirement. As such, it reduces uh, the chances of excessive expiration misses for some applications. And this approach uh, remove the complex refresh mechanism and give better efficiency in both energy and latency. But still, minor expiration misses are not avoidable. And expired blocks remain a problem, but we think Prefetcher may help here. Let's look at two examples which will demonstrate how Prefetcher helped bring expired blocks back into the cache. In these two graphs, different colors represent different prefetch stream, and the numbers represent the PC address of the corresponding prefetch stream. On the left-hand side, the expired block are not prefetched. Let's say a demand request access uh, to an expired block and cause a demand miss because the, because the cache block in the same prefetch stream are brought to the cache together. So it's very possible that they will get expired together. If the, if the first block of a prefetch stream expire, the rest is possibly expired too. So in this example, the demand request continue to access subsequent blocks and continue to cause demand miss. On the right-hand side, the prefetcher reloads expired blocks. Again, let's begin from the first block. It's a demand miss because of an expired block, but this time the prefetcher begins to load the subsequent blocks so that the rest will become demand hits and reduce expiration misses. We want to quantify 
the potential benefits that we can get from prefetching expired blocks. So here we use a stride prefetcher uh, with prefetch distance 16 on spec CPU 2017 benchmarks. With this prefetcher, this graph show how many expired blocks can be predicted and reused by the prefetcher. So on average, 10.85% of expired blocks can be reloaded into a cache through the Stripe prefetcher. And over 21 benchmarks in spec CPU 2017, 13 of them have more than 10% reuse rate. So let's say we have a demand miss, uh, a, load, a load address here, and then the prefetcher issue prefetches from A plus one to A plus four. Then CPU issues demand requests to A plus one and A plus two. Their, their demand hits because the cache block is already uh, preloaded in, in the cache. And now here comes SDTRAM's expiration. After, expir after retention time, blocks begin to be expired because A plus one and A plus two are accessed by CPU. They are used prefetches. On the other hand, A plus three and A plus four become unused prefetches during expirations. So what we want to do here is to determine this retention time to make sure it's long enough to hold correct prefetches and wait until demand requests uh, come, come to fetch the cache block. To achieve this, we monitor these outliers, they expire on used prefetches. Let's say for one benchmark, we didn't spot many unused prefetches in long retention times, but when we shorter uh, the retention time and got many unused prefetches, it means the prefetch pattern is correct and we may want to uh, increase a little, the retention time a little bit longer to just hold the prefetches. On next, we will introduce a heuristic algorithm to show how we use expire unused prefetches during the profiling phase to determine the retention time. Here we introduce prefetch aware retention time tuning. First, for each retention option, we sample 1 billion instructions to gather essential hardware counters. We look at two numbers, all PF and expire PF. All PF is a fraction of total prefetches in all MSHR requests. Expire PF is a fraction of expire unused prefetches in total prefetches. We check if all PF is greater than uh, 0.1% to determine if the prefetches are uh, substantial in memory traffic. If no, the, the algorithm will switch to misspace tuning. And if yes, the algorithm will move on to the next step. Check if a base expired PF has been set. If the base have not been set, the algorithm will check if the current expired PF is significant enough. If it is, it will set a space, a space expired PF. And if the base has been set yet, the algorithm will check if the expired PF greater than two times of base expired PF. If it is, then this is our final retention time. And it's not uh, greater than two times of base, it will join other co condition and move on to the next retention time option and repeat the iteration again. And now we have the retention time ready. We and we want to use the gather information to decide the prefetch distance. And let's say we already have a given retention time here, and it can generally hold the prefetches until demand requests come in. If CPU demand requests continue to hit, we won't record many expired unused prefetches at the end of profiling phase. So in this case, expired PF is low. And because the prefetch pattern in this case is correct. So we will map to a long prefetch distance just because, just because the pattern is correct. In this case, 
there are not many demand request hits. And some prefetches like this become expired and used prefetches at the end. So in this case, we map to median prefetch distance. And then finally, in this case, the prefetcher doesn't capture uh, CPU's access pattern. So switch to zero prefetch distance and keep and keep minimal prefetch distance just only to maintain the prefetch function. So here are some highlights of our experiment result. In summary, compared to the base SDTRAM cache for which we use prior work, LARS without prefetching expired blocks. Energy and latency were reduced by 22.24% and 24.59% respectively. Compared to LARS with a prior prefetching technique, uh, near side throttling or NST, our work reduced the average energy and latency by 3.5% and 3.59% respectively, while reducing the implementation overhead by 54.55%. So in summary, we study prefetching in the SCT RAM and propose a new approach for determining both retention time and prefetch distance in reduced retention time SCT RAM caches. Please read our papers for more details uh, of our work. We have link and a QR code here. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, I ask the author to um, unmute, please. Um, and if the audience have any questions, uh, please type it in the chat. And meanwhile, I have a question for uh, the presenter. Uh, is the presenter here? Kyle Kwan. Is Kyle Kwan here? Okay, so it seems the presenter is not here. So if you have any questions about this paper, maybe you can direct it by email directly um, to uh, um, um, the authors. Uh, so now we will move to uh, our last paper um, with uh, the title Unified TP, a unified TLB and page table cache structure for efficient address translation and will be presented by Zulin Ma, who is a PhD student in Chongping University. First, thanks for the introduction. Please let me introduce our unified TLB and PTC structures named Unified TP. My presentation will follow this outline. Now, let's go to the background. Recent years, data is growing at an exponential rate and is not going to slow down in the short time. According to the report, the amount of data has increased 44 times from 2009 to 2020. As a result, the storage and memory capacity increase and applications with less data set emerge. Therefore, the pressure on virtual memory performance is dramatically increasing. Previous work focused on two ways to improve the performance of adjust translation. The first is to decrease the TLB miss rate. For example, huge pages are used to expand the translation coverage of TLBs. The second focus on reducing the TLB miss handling latency. For example, page table cache are used to store upper level page table entries to reduce long latency page table walks. These methods are used exclusively either for TLBs or PTCs. 
We believe that the structural separation between TLBs and QPCs limits the acceleration of a drug's translation. Now, let me show you the motivation of our work. To give a better understanding, we divide the workloads into two types based on their memory access behaviors. The data in the first type of applications tends to have a long reuse distance, which means that when a data item is accessed again, the translation record for that data item has been deleted from TLBs. In our experiments, the results showed that about 5% pages contribute 50% of the total TLB misses for full graph workloads. In this case, if we can shrink the PTC space and provide more space for TLB, it can reduce memory size overhead. The second type of applications, such as time serial databases, is characterized by sequential size of memory pages. That is to say, there are almost no repeat requests, so the utilization of TLBs is very low. On the contrary, PTCs have a high hit rate because of the good locality. In this case, we can delete useless TLB entries and expand PTC space to reduce memory access overhead. Therefore, the physical and logical separations of TLB and PTC structures renders it impossible to dynamically adjust their sizes according to the workloads. In order to solve this problem, we propose a unified TLB and PTC structure. As shown in the left picture, we combine TLB and PTC into a single structure. In our design, for TLB entries, they are similar to those in the baseline system. And for PTC entries, they adopt the same indexing scheme as TLB entries to make it easier to design and implement in hardware. As shown in the right picture, the tag of a PTC entry is a portion of virtual page number. This baseline system enables the respective circuitries of TLBs and PTCs. Searching entries can be executed in parallel. In contrast, searching entries in unified TP should be executed in a sequential order if there is only one circuitry. Therefore, we propose a parallel, parallel search scheme. The basic idea is to provide equal circuitries as baseline system. When receiving a memory request, each circuitry checks one of the corresponding entry among TLB and level 2 to level 4 entries. According to the check result, Replacement information should be updated. In this case, multiple circuitries hits may incur data consistency issues. Therefore, among the hit entries, we update the replacement information of the entry with the longest tag to make sure that only one entry will be updated once a time. According to the parallel search, we also need to modify the LRU algorithm. When inserting, uh, when insert missing entries into unified TP, the insert order is from the upper to lower level. 
This is because heats in lower level require fewer memory accesses than those in upper levels. Then, LRU algorithm can evict entries according to the workloads. Next, I will show you the experimental data. We implemented the unified TP on a trace-based simulator and use pin binary instrumentation tool to generate the memory access trace. The data size of our evaluation includes two kernels from PASIC search, graph 500, and three workloads of graph big search. The detailed setting of system configuration is shown in the table. We evaluate the number of TLB misses and memory accesses of unified TP and baseline system. The experimental results show that unified TP reduces TLB misses rate and memory accesses by 35.69% and 36.93% on average for all benchmarks respectively. This picture shows the execution time based on the latencies in the table of experiment setup. The results show that Unified TP achieves performance improvements by 11.12% on average for all benchmarks. The contributions of our work are as follows. First, we propose Unified TP to dynamically adjust their entries based on the size characteristics of workloads. Second, we designed a parallel search scheme to improve the search performance. And finally, we proposed a modified LRU replacement algorithm to help identify the code TLB and PTC entries. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I ask um, the presenter and any authors to unmute uh, themselves. Um, if there are any questions from the audience, um, please let us know from the chat. And meanwhile, I have a question for Zolin Ma. Um, okay, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the unified TP associativity? I mean, is it set associative, fully associative, and why did you make this decision? Okay, um, for such um, associative, it refer to what the baseline system has. Um, this is because um, both TLB and PDC are indexed by virtual drives. So the rightmost uh, several bits of virtual page number are used as that index, and the remainders of um, VPN are used as the tag. So in this way, TLB and PTC entries have a uniform scheme, um, which makes unified TP be a hardware-friendly structure. OK, great. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? All right, thanks a lot, Zulin. Um, and this actually concludes um, our session um, about memory and cache optimization. Thank you all for attending. And in about 10 minutes, uh, there will be the other two sessions, uh, parallel session um, 3A and 3B. Uh, the 3A about neural network on edge systems and 3B about uh, design automations, okay? Thank you all for attending and I hope you'll enjoy the rest of ICCD. Thanks.